Customizing your trains on this episode of Toy Train Tips and Tricks. Hello again, this is Mike with another episode of Toy Train Tips and Tricks. Lionel, Marks, K-Line, and other manufacturers made many exciting models in a variety of color schemes over the years, but even so, they couldn't make every model in every color scheme. That's where custom decoration comes in. Thanks to widespread access to graphics creation software and its general ease of use, painting and decorating your own models is easier now than it has ever been. On the other hand, this ease of availability has also forced a number of decal manufacturers who once did the hard work for you out of business. Perhaps the best way to dip one's foot into the art of custom decorating is to start with your own imaginary railroad. Scale modelers often refer to operating an imaginary rail line as freelancing. There are many advantages to freelancing a railroad. First, you avoid the problems of trying to match reality exactly. For example, you may be a fan of EMD's big DDE 40X diesels, but you exclusively model the Santa Fe. While you could ignore reality and just run your big war bonnet version, that's always an option. But your ribbit counting friends would point out that Santa Fe never owned such diesels. But what if your imaginary Sam Hill and Southern did own these diesels and the SHNS was a subsidiary of the Santa Fe? Now you can run your big diesels with your Santa Fe equipment with a glimmer of believability. The focus of my railroad is circa 1977, but I like Alco FAs and EMD E7s and Trainmasters and even a few steamers, all of which were extinct or nearly so on real railroads by that time. But the historian in me can justify running such diesels on my own railroad alongside the Jeeps and U-boats of the real railroads of the time. Of course, your custom trains can be as whimsical or real as you like. You could, for example, decorate diesels for your favorite NFL team or college or whatever. How about special locomotives in special colors and lettering for the grandkids? The possibilities are endless. So let's get started. First, I have three cabooses, a Lionel SB type, a Lionel M5C porthole caboose, and a Kusan center cupola type no collectible variations were damaged in this process. First, stripping the models. If you ask 100 modelers, you'll likely get 40 or 50 different answers on how to strip paint from old trains. My preferred product is this purple type degreasing cleaner. I'm currently using the Zep brand concentrated version, but any of the purple brands are essentially the same. I use a Sterilite or Rubbermaid container designed for shoe storage and pour the cleaner in full strength. Submerge your models, put on the lid, and come back in a day or two. Of course, I didn't have to do anything to the SB type as it was already undecorated. The lettering for the porthole caboose came off very easily. The Kusan had several layers of paint on it already, and I had to keep it in the soaking solution for four or five days, and then use a medium toothbrush to clean off any stubborn parts. I gave everything a good cold water rinse, and they were ready to paint after they dried off. I also have a seamer shell, a Lionel number 250-242. Preparation for this model was simple, a slightly soapy warm water bath to remove the grime, and a quick bit of sanding to remove the heat stamp numbers. Next came the painting, but what colors? If you're trying to create a believable freelance railroad, it helps to consider what real railroads in your era and your geography did. For crew safety, the main caboose color is a bright orange color, just as many railroads painted their cabooses red or yellow. The caboose roofs are silver to reflect sunlight to help keep them cool in the hot summer sun. Steam locomotives generally wore black or dark gray paint and sometimes sported a lighter gray or silver on the smoke box. I went with a black and light gray combination. For the actual painting, I used my Iwata Neo airbrush system and the spray booth I featured in an earlier episode. You can use spray cans, but if you do a lot of painting, you will find that the airbrush system will soon pay for itself. Also, airbrushing gives you the option of mixing custom colors that are not available in rattle cans. First, the entire caboose body is painted orange. My orange is the color in the Tester's acrylic craft paint line. Yes, you can use cheap acrylic craft paints in your airbrush. I thin this product 6040 paint to distilled water for spraying. Some craft paints work best when thinned with water, and 
Others would thin with isopropyl alcohol. Test the mix in a bottle before putting it in your airbrush, as certain pigments and certain brands will turn into sludge when mixed with IPA. Of course, you can also use paints that are specifically designed for airbrush use. These work straight from the bottle and often provide a superior finish, but they're also more expensive and fewer colors are available. The craft paints generally work well enough for my taste. Use many thin coats rather than trying to load your model up with paint all at once. Also, some colors tend to hide better than others. Orange and yellow do not cover well at all. It took about seven coats of orange to get a good finish on these cabooses. Once the orange was finished, I masked off all the areas of the body I wanted to remain orange. I used regular 3M blue masking tape for this. Use body features such as rivet lines or roof gutters as a guide to help make a clean color delineation. Make sure the ends of the tape are pressed down firmly. The silver paint is a generic craft acrylic I found at Hobby Lobby. Thinning with water just like the orange, this paint covered well in just two coats. After letting the final coat set overnight, I gently and carefully removed the masking tape. There were a few small spots that I needed to touch up with a brush, but otherwise it worked. Next, the locomotive. I started by painting the smoke box gray using, again, a basic craft acrylic I found at Hobby Lobby. Two coats looked pretty good, but I added a third just to make sure. I then masked off the smoke box using the regular blue tape as before and painted everything else black, again using the craft acrylic from Hobby Lobby. Three coats later, everything was ready. I also painted the tenders with the same black paint for the sake of uniformity. Again, letting the paint cure overnight, it was time to remove the masking tape. When the paint looked the way I wanted it, I sprayed a coat of Gloss Clear Coat. This will add some protection to the paint and will provide a good base for the decals. Speaking of decals, in between coats of paint, I designed my lettering and logos using the Open Office suite of apps. I felt that the Deja Vu Serif font worked great as a traditional railroad font. I designed the traditional logo in the Paint app. First, I did a web search for a free clip art outline of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, the three states my railroad runs through. Then, to represent the belt operation and the railroad's nickname, I used the circle tool to draw two concentric circles around the Cincinnati area of the map. I erased part of the inside circle and added a line to the outside circle, making a QC logo for Queen City lines. I measured the areas of the cabooses where I wanted the graphics and arranged them on a page in a Word document. The caboose graphics are simple black writing on clear decal paper. There are many brands of decal paper available for home printers, and they generally come in either clear backing or white backing. I wanted clear backing for this application. Before you print onto your decal paper, First, run a test print on regular paper, cut out the designs, and check the look of the graphics. If you need to make changes, now is the best time before you waste an expensive sheet of decal paper. Once everything is to your liking, print the designs on a sheet of decal paper. Trim off any unused portions of the sheet for later use. Waste not what not. Let the ink fully dry on the sheet before proceeding, waiting at least 30 minutes. Then, the clear decals must be sealed before they are ready for use. I am using Tester's brand decals that came in a kit along with its own spray sealer. I've seen other brands that recommend this Rust-Oleum brand sealer, but I assume that any gloss sealer will do the trick. I don't like using spray cans in the house, so it was fortunate that the weather cooperated by providing a few days of fall spring so I could open up the garage door and spray the sheet outdoors. There are also some water-based sealers available that may be used in my indoor spray booth, but I'm using the cans up first. Waste not, what not. After about an hour, your decals will be dry and ready to use. You will need a container of warm water, some paper towels, a few cotton swabs, scissors, tweezers, and possibly an X-Acto knife. In addition, you will need a decal setting solution and a decal solvent. These are two different products. The setting solution primes the surface to receive the decal and makes it easier to position the decal on the model. Decal solvent dissolves the decal sheet and allows the ink to settle down into the model for a better fit and to allow molded in areas in the model to be seen through the decal. 
The leading products on the market are Microscale's Microset and Microsol. I'm currently out of Microsol, and so is my local hobby shop, and so is Hobby Lobby, and so is Amazon. Another popular decal solvent is Solvaset, but it too seems to be out of stock everywhere. As a last resort, I made my own decal solvent, which I will describe in a moment. I do not recommend this unless absolutely necessary, as it is a delicate mix and Microsol seems to work very well every time without worry. Using good scissors, cut a decal from your sheet. Using tweezers, dip the decal in warm water for 10 to 15 seconds and then set it on a paper towel. While the decal is activating, use a paintbrush to apply Microset on the area of the model where the decal will be set. Again, using the tweezers, place the decal in the proper area of the model and use the tweezers and a cotton swab to slide the decal backing away from the decal. Then, carefully place the decal in its proper position. Use a cotton swab working from the middle out to push out extra solution and settle the decal into place. Once the decal settles down, it's time for a decal solvent. Again, I prefer to use Microsol, but in a pinch, I made my own using 50% IPA and lacquer thinner. The mix is about 80% alcohol to lacquer thinner. Mix together and shake. If you use too much lacquer thinner, you can dissolve the decal completely, so be careful. Use a brush to dab the solvent on the decal and leave it alone. Don't force it in and don't move things around. Let the solvent work and settle the decal into place. After a few minutes, if the decal hasn't settled enough, add a little bit more solvent and wait. Repeat the process for all the decals on one side of the model, then wait about 15 minutes or so and you can turn the model over and repeat the process for the decals on the other side. Once all the decals are set, it's time to protect them with another clear coat. You can use another gloss coat, but most modelers prefer a satin finish on the final product. And the most popular product for this is Tester's Dull Coat. I'm again using up an old spray can first, but this is now also available in a bottle for airbrush use. Spray on one good coat and let it dry. The dull coat will not only seal the paint and decals, but the flat finish will also help hide the decal edges or silvering as many hobbyists call it. Allow the dull coat to dry for an hour or so and you can reassemble your model. And here's the first of my three custom cabooses. I will repeat the same lettering process for the other two. I also tried an experiment with custom white decals. For my steam locomotives, I wanted plain white lettering against plain black paint. This might be accomplished by using a white background decal paper and printing a black outline around the unprinted letters. Decal preparation and application are otherwise identical to clear decal application. My hope was that the black ink on the decals would be close enough to the sheet of black paint as to be unnoticeable. Alas, after application and dull coating, the difference between the two shades of black is simply too great, and the decal outlines are obvious. My options are to try to find a black paint that is closer matched to my ink color, which would take lots of trial and error, or punt on the white lettering and switch to yellow or another color on a clear decal instead. Or if I really want the white, I could resort to dry transfers, which is not my preferred method. In any case, my tender is going to be redone. Lesson learned. But despite this failure, my O-scale train crews now have the first of three snazzy new caboose, cabooses, cabooses to ride in. I hope you found this video to be both enjoyable and useful, and if so, please like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment about any other tips you might have for customizing your models. Keep the trains, both real and imaginary, running, and we'll catch you next time on Toy Train Tips and Tricks.